Afternoon, everyone. We start uh, this afternoon with uh, sad news. Uh, I learned this morning uh, that a member of our state employee family, Ohio Corrections Officer John Dawson, has died from the coronavirus. Mr. Dawson uh, was 55 years old, from Mansfield, uh, was a correction officer at the Marion Correction Institution. He had worked there since 1996. He tested positive for COVID-19 on March 30th and was the second officer to test positive in the Marion facility. He worked in the control center, the key control room, handling, handing out equipment to staff. He had underlying health conditions. Uh, our hearts go out to his family, his friends, and to his co-workers. Uh, you are all in our prayers, and we're very, very sorry. We currently have 48 members of the staff who tested positive, 17 inmates, and those come from seven uh, of our prisons. We are very aggressively testing in the prisons, so when someone has symptoms, they're, they are tested. We are uh, doing well in Ohio, and I think when you watch the news and you see what's happening in other places, um, we're doing well. Uh, you all have done a great job. but. Mr. Dawson's death uh, reminds us that as we celebrate the fact that Ohio is con doing comparatively well, uh, we are still seeing a large number of deaths. Uh, people are dying every single day. Dr. Acton will have that report uh, that continues, and we know that will continue uh, for some time. So. Our heart goes out not only to Mr. Dawson's family, uh, but to all those families who are suffering uh, because they have lost a loved one because of the coronavirus. One of our great challenges in Ohio, and something that I think about in the morning, I think about at night, is the fact that we do not have personal protection equipment for every Ohioan that needs it. The need for this is great. The need for this is great because of the coronavirus. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about this, and there, there, is some, there is some good news. Let me start with what Battelle is doing, uh, and we talked about that about the fact that Battelle now has, Battelle located in central Ohio here, now has the ability to basically recycle, uh, sterilize 160,000 masks a day. Um, why is this important? It's important because we don't have enough masks. We have people who are in nursing homes that aren't don't have the mask, who are working there. Uh, we have first responders who don't have masks. We have people in hospitals who are wearing their masks much longer uh, than the normal protocol would provide. We are trying to get masks into the state. I was on the phone last night talking to someone who's working to get us masks in from China. And this is a struggle. And so the use of Battelle and the recycling of these masks is so very, very important. And so I got off the phone a couple hours ago with the CEOs of many of our hospitals, but I want to make a, a public plea to them and to everybody in every hospital in the state of Ohio or any place where you are using personal uh, protection equipment when you're using these masks. 
Uh, every mask is precious. Do not throw one away. We now have the ability in Ohio to use that mask up to 20 times. Uh, and the way it works um, is they can be taken into Battelle, and Battelle will run those, and they basically mark on the mask how many times that mask has been run. So every time they mark it, change the number on, on that mask. So this is very, very important. And I would say to, to everyone uh, who has these masks, uh, it's important to recycle them. It's in very, very important to do this. And when you do not do that, when you do not do that, you are really denying somebody else a mask uh, because we only have so many. And we are getting them in. Uh, we're trying to distribute them uh, where it's appropriate, where the need is the most. But we are a long way from being able to give the appropriate protection uh, to everyone out there that needs it. Our, our grocery workers and others, they need protection uh, as well. So we are all in this together, and I just appeal again to our hospitals uh, to send those masks to, to Battelle. Please, please take advantage of that. Uh, they can reach Battelle at battelle.org, B-A-T-T-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E dot org. This is uh, Child Abuse Prevention Month, and I'm wearing a, a blue tie, uh, a plain blue tie, uh, in honor of Child Pre Prevention Month. Uh, Child Abuse Prevention Month um, reminds us uh, of how precious children are, and it reminds us of how important it is that if we know or have any information about a child who is being abused, that we report that. Uh, this is a particularly difficult time uh, because many times the people who report child abuse are what we call mandatory reporters. Uh, there are people who, by law, when they see an abuse, they report it. Uh, some of the people who do the best reporting are our school teachers. And now, of course, with kids not in physical buildings, there's not the opportunity for the other eyes outside a home to look at that child. So I would ask everyone else uh, to try to be more vigilant uh, as we go through this period of time. Uh, the reports of child abuse are down. I think we can fairly say that that's not because child abuse is down. Uh, it is because we do not have enough eyes on, on these children. So if you're in a situation where you can see what's going on, we would ask you, uh, please make sure you report this. Uh, you can call 855-OH-CHILD. That's 855-642-4453. 855-642-4453. Finally, uh, let me thank our children's services workers. Uh, you're at the forefront. You're out there. You're making a difference. You do it 365 days a year. Uh, we are very, very grateful for what you do. Some happy news. Uh, I was on the phone last night uh, when Fran and I were actually taking a walk on our farm uh, with Tim Cook. Um, CEO of Apple, uh, and I just called him to thank him for a very, very valuable gift, uh, and that is 100,000 of the N95 masks. So we will be getting those out to our frontline health workers. Uh, we thank Apple. Uh, we thank Tim Cook. Uh, we thank the entire Apple family. Those 100,000, I can guarantee you, will be well used here in the state of Ohio, and we are very, very grateful. I also want to thank Jobs Ohio and One Columbus for making the connection to Apple. Uh, Jobs Ohio is providing input uh, as part of the PPP, PPE Alliance and assisting the state with rapid procurement uh, requirements. We're very appreciative of them for doing that. Our goal each day uh, is to do everything we can to protect our protectors those folks who are out there at the front line uh, making a difference. Let me now talk a little bit about the National Guard. Uh, as we've talked 
before the National Guard is directly now involved uh, in helping our food banks across the state of Ohio. Uh, they're helping to distribute food and supplies to families. Uh, these food banks heavily relied on volunteers. Uh, many of these volunteers were older, and during this stay-at-home order, they certainly need the help. And so the National Guard has stepped up, and so we thank the members of the National Guard who are doing this. Uh, members are also working uh, with, with General Harris and Dr. Acton helping to expand hospital capacity in our state. And we've talked about that the last two days, but the Guard is out there uh, making sure that we have the space that we're going to need, the beds that we're going to need. Let me also thank the Guard, uh, those members of the Guard who are supporting Ohio Emergency Management and the Ohio Department of Health to collect and take the inventory, store, and package the personal protection equipment for redistribution across the state. We're very grateful for all that they are doing. In the midst of the most challenging public health pandemic in over 100 years, uh, it's more important than ever to celebrate public health. Uh, during the first full week of April each year, the American Public Health Association brings together communities across the United States to observe a National Public Health Week, a time to recognize the contributions of those who work in public health. Uh, this year marks the 25th anniversary of National Public Health Week. Uh, right here in Ohio, as you've heard Dr. Acton say, and John and I say, there's 113 local public health departments who are doing amazing work. Uh, so we thank all of them, the members of the public health community, and we also thank uh, everyone who's helping, uh, who's at the front line in, in this battle, our doctors, our nurses, our first responders. Uh, we thank you. Tina Houston, wife of our Lieutenant Governor, uh, forward a video made by members of the Harmony Project uh, here in Columbus a music and volunteer community service organization. Uh, they wanted to share their thanks, and uh, Eric will take a look at that video. To all of our doctors, our nurses, our EMS workers, our physician's assistants, direct care providers, to all of you who are out there on the front lines, risking your lives to save our lives, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's so proud and thankful for all that you're doing. And every morning in Tefillah, we think about you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You are heroes and heroes. Thank you so much. My deepest gratitude, thank you so much. We offer you these virtual hugs as a reminder of the incredible gratitude we have for you. Thank you for everything you do and for keeping your family safe. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you. I just want to say thank you to all of you who are out there on the front lines. May peace and strength be with you. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Please know we love you. We appreciate you. We honor you. Thank you. In this together, Ohio, we thank all of them. Very nice. Uh, some other good news uh, today I've asked the board the Ohio Bureau of Workers' Compensation, BWC, to send up to $1.6 billion in dividends to Ohio employers and to send it this spring to ease the impact uh, that the COVID-19 has had on our economy and our business community. Um, we hope that this, we know that this will help. Uh, this dividend equals approximately 100% of the premiums employers paid in policy year 2018. BWC will apply the dividend to employers' outstanding balances first, including the recent installment deferrals. Any amounts exceeding outstanding balances will be sent to the employer. Uh, for those employers, it means one less bill to worry about. As in previous years, the dividend is possible due to strong investment returns on employers' premiums, a declining number of claims each year, and prudent fiscal management. It's also due to employers who work hard to improve workplace safety and reduce injury claims, and to the employees who do that as well. 
Uh, even with the downturn in the market, BWC is able to provide this important dividend to employers while maintaining funds to take care of engine workers for years to come. Um, if approved by the board of BWC, approximately $1.4 billion will go to private employers. Approximately $200 million will go to local government taxing districts. Checks will start going out later uh, this month. As you may recall, a couple of weeks ago, we announced a new campaign for Ohio, uh, Find It Here, to support local restaurants and retailers during this time. Find It Here has been the, the kind of the slogan uh, of our, our folks in tourism, but we want to utilize that in regard to our restaurants um, who are able to provide takeout. Um, we continue to try to support them, and we thank them for what they do. Uh, today we're launching a new video and new print ads to continue our efforts to support and showcase our local businesses. Uh, let's take a look. Always been a great place to live and work. And now local businesses need our support more than ever. It's up to all of us to stay in, order out, shop local online, and keep Ohio strong. Because even though right now we have to keep our distance, in Ohio, we've never been closer. Have carry out for dinner tonight. You can visit ohio.org slash support local Ohio uh, to see the restaurants. Again, that's ohio.org slash support local Ohio to see uh, the restaurants, the shops, and the virtual activities from across the state. Um, now I think Kim Hall is here. Uh, Kim will co be coming up on the screen in a minute. Uh, Kim heads up Jobs and Family Services. She's going to give us a little update. Uh, is a huge, huge department that covers uh, many, many, many things. So Kim, thank you for, there you are. Thanks for being with us and give us a, a little report. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. I too am wearing blue today, and I also want to acknowledge all of those who work in the children's services field, especially our caseworkers who are on the front lines of protecting Ohio's most vulnerable population. Thank you so much. The Department of Job and Family Services operates eight statewide programs that impact the lives of millions of Ohioans every day. Our agency has always focused on providing opportunities and support for people in need. And now the 2,100 employees that make up the ODJFS team are diligently working to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. As our challenges have multiplied, so have our efforts in key areas. In partnership with local agencies and other state offices, ODJFS is working to meet the needs of workers who have experienced sudden unemployment, businesses who are looking to hire, trying to avoid layoffs and planning for the future, parents who need continued support with childcare, and families who help, need help putting food on the table. I will provide a few updates on each of these areas during my time with you today. Please know that our top agency priority right now is our unemployment program. Since March 15th, hundreds of thousands of Ohioans have filed for unemployment. I want to say to every Ohioan that is unemployed, I know that you're experiencing tremendous pressure and anxiety about your situation. Adding to your difficulty is the fact that our system is overwhelmed by the unprecedented influx of, un, influx of claims and it is moving much slower than it would under normal circumstances. You are the people I am thinking about every day as we work to meet your needs. I want everyone impacted to know that I understand and my entire team understands that you are proud, hardworking people who have done everything you can to be productive members of this economy and support your families. All eligible Ohioans will receive their unemployment benefits and any delays in processing claims will not reduce the amount received. We have so far paid over $124 million to 195,000 Ohioans as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are hiring more people, working longer hours, and adding more technological capacity 
so that we can serve you as quickly as possible. We have extended our call center to a seven day a week operation. And by the end of this week, we will have close to 1000 staff taking calls. Our planning is underway and moving rapidly to build the new system for self-employed claimants and other groups that the federal government has granted expanded eligibility. I am deeply grateful for the unwavering support of the governor, the lieutenant governor, and my cabinet colleagues as we aggressively pursue these solutions. For those Ohioans whose jobs have, impact, have been impacted by this crisis, we understand that you have earned these benefits and our team will not rest until you receive them. We know how hard businesses have been hit by COVID-19. The governor and lieutenant governor have addressed this issue every day. We have partnered with the governor's office of workforce transformation in the launch of a job search website, coronavirus.ohio.gov forward slash job search. And it has postings for essential jobs that employers have open right now. There are also many Ohio businesses seeking alternatives to laying off employees. For those businesses, we've posted layoff aversion information on coronavirus.ohio.gov that outline programs like Shared Work Ohio that provide options for employers to explore prior to laying off their employees. ODJFS and local workforce areas are still providing employment services. Half of the state's Ohio Means job centers have remained open and the others are providing assistance virtually to help job seekers with their unemployment needs. Additionally, the OhioMeetsJobs.com website is still a great online resource to meet the needs of those who are looking to get hired at essential businesses or are taking this time to brush up on their skills. We know that childcare is a critical need in order for parents to work, and ODGFS is man managing the pandemic childcare program for essential workers that the governor announced in March. More than 2,200 programs have been approved to operate since March 17th, and so far we have nearly 22,000 children enrolled. These programs are all required to meet basic health and safety standards while also limiting capacity to no more than six children in a space as we stay mindful of our social distancing guidelines. Nutrition assistance is another key ODGFS program that is critical at this time. As the governor shared yesterday, JFS will provide additional support to Ohioans enrolled in the SNAP program during the pandemic. Beginning this week, those who did not already receive the maximum monthly allotment for their household size in March will be issued an additional payment. Also, Ohio obtained federal approval to waive administrative verifications that are normally required at food banks, and this streamlines the process and limits person-to-person -person contact. Individuals may qualify for the SNAP program if their household's gross monthly income is at or under 130% of the federal poverty guidelines. To apply, please visit benefits.ohio.gov. We are glad to be able to offer this additional assistance and hope these measures will help families stretch their monthly food budgets as we weather this storm. I am so proud to work shoulder to shoulder with some of the most talented leaders in the nation at this moment in time. I know this is a difficult time, but ODGFS is here to present opportunities and we will weather this storm together. Thank you, Governor, for the time. Thanks, Director. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Lieutenant Governor. Uh, thank you, Governor, and uh, thank you, Director Hall. Um, I know one thing that we all understand is that behind a statistic is a real person. Uh, it is a real person who, for example, if you're attempting to get unemployment benefits, who has needs, who has uh, uh, concerns and, and fears in life, and, and we, we understand how important it is. And I know the director and her team are working very hard to uh, provide all the services that they do at the Department of Job and Family Services here in the state of Ohio. Uh, ha pivoting from that, uh, I know that there is a great irony that also exists in our economy right now because at coronavirus.ohio.gov uh, forward slash job search, there are now 33,641 jobs that are available from 478 employers. Now we need to understand what's behind this. We have screened this system 
This system only includes businesses that we, we know are not just essential, but critical to the supply chain of serving you during this difficult time. Anything from healthcare uh, to manufacturing that maybe is ramping up to make some of the PPEs and critical equipment uh, to the food supply chain. All of this is incredibly important and there are over 33,000 jobs available right now. So if you are in a position that you can fill one of those jobs or you know somebody who can, please send them to the job search uh, portion of the coronavirus.ohio.gov website. And um, I know that one of the questions that I get and the governor gets uh, all the time are from people who are wondering, um, when will things get back to normal? And what will that be based on? Uh, this, is a, this is a question that we wrestle with constantly. Uh, it's a complicated answer. There's no doubt about it. And I first want to start with the good news. The good news is that thanks to the wisdom and decisive action of the governor, Governor DeWine, Ohio's in a much better place today than we thought it would be. Uh, we have not... Uh, uh, experience the catastrophic scenarios that we surely would have if those actions hadn't taken place. So that's the good news. And it's not only the governor's actions, more importantly, it's your actions in response to what he asked you to do, which was the social distancing, uh, the hygiene habits, and all that comes along with trying to make sure that we slow the spread. And. Uh, and that's the good news, because collectively, you, we, as a state, have saved a lot of lives and avoided the, the catastrophic scenarios that we surely would have experienced without those actions taking place. Now, the bad news. Uh, the bad news is, is that we are still deep in the midst of a health crisis. Uh, in a few moments, Dr. Acton's going to give you the statistics of what happened overnight. Uh, more people went to the hospital, more people died than the day before. Uh, and those aren't models, those are real people. Those are people with families, people with loved ones, um, and we deeply, deeply care about what happens to them and that we know that we are still in a battle that has to be won. And that's the bad news. But another consideration also as you look at this is something the governor touched on earlier, which is the existence of PPE. We don't have enough yet. We have to conserve what we have because there are many people out there on the front lines who need it and deserve it. And we can't open things up and put more people in, in, at, in jeopardy until we have the protective equipment that will give them uh, a sense of comfort and a sense of protection that they really deserve as they're out there working and trying to serve all of us. And um, we're working hard at it. We're trying to build the capacity in Ohio from our manufacturers. And we're trying to, to acquire it wherever we can. You know, those are they're really the, uh, the big pieces. And it's really trying to find that balance, the balance to execute the Ohio strategy. And I know that as we continue to do this, that we're going to be better off. So in digging into this, you know, we ask ourselves, well, what, what should... What might that future look like? What could that future look like in Ohio? Governor announced a team of people from the private sector that are working on this. We, we have a staff of people in the health that are working on the health aspect of this, consulting medical professionals. We're not doing this in isolation. We are asking, uh, we are asking people who know, who are professionals, who are experts at this, you know, what is it that we need to do to help? And so life won't exactly go back to what it was like pre-coronavirus. Um, uh, there will be a, a, lot of thoughtful, uh, a lot of thoughtful decisions that need to be made to make sure that as we emerge from the first surge that we don't create a second surge of, of uh, spread. A vaccine would be a game changer. We would love it if there was a vaccine. That would solve so many problems, wouldn't it, Dr. Acton? <laughs> but it's not likely that we're going to have that for a year or longer. And one of the people who I think we all in this room respect, and I think the nation respects, Dr. Anthony Fauci said it like this, it's not like a light switch on and off. It's a gradual pulling back of 
uh, on certain of the restrictions as we try to get society a bit back to normal. And Dr. Fauci continued that the first condition is a steep drop in the number of cases, which we haven't seen yet, in the actual number of cases. And you've got to make sure uh, you are absolutely going in the right direction. And then he said, you gradually come back. You don't jump into this with both feet. And, and that was the advice of, of Dr. Fauci. So what does this look like? Like, what can you, I, I imagine if I'm, if I'm out there and I'm trying to think, how do I prepare for, my, prepare for this? What does it look like? And, and it, it looks like it's pretty much common sense as we go through these things. But I'm going to give you a few examples that have been deployed around the world and that, that people who are working on this are su going to suggest. First of all, the emphasis on hygiene, even when that day comes that we relieve the restrictions, does not go away. It, it, it's not going to go away. Hand washing, sanitizers, these are still going to be part of our lives. Masks will become more common than should be uh, to, to control the spread. Gloves, too. And uh, as, I, as I have to smile a little bit, don't be offended if you don't get handshakes or hugs for quite a while. Uh, <laughs> we're going to have to change the way that we interact as long as this is a threat in our lives. Testing. We need more of it. Uh, testing is critical to finding our way out of this. Uh, more tests determine who's carrying the virus. And then the antibody testing that we've been working on is very important because we'll know once we have that who has the defense, uh, who has the defense and who is uh, going to be uh, better able uh, to do some of the frontline work that we need to have happen. And there's also a lot of talk, this is, this is something that uh, many states are working on, a lot of talk about effective supplemental tools to, to track uh, the symptoms data and to know uh, who you may have come in contact with who had uh, the disease or um, where people are who have the immunity. Crowds in crowded areas will be bad for a while. <laughs> this is not something that we're going to flip a switch on for sure. Uh, this is what all the studies have shown, how, how difficult that is. So if you think about this as an employer, uh, that's your workspace configuration and common area configurations. However you're looking at it, we're, we're not going to allow, we're not going to I'm not going to want people to congregate, even when we start to when we begin to restart some of these things. That might mean more space between tables, staggered seating, uh, limiting congestion in crowded spaces, appointment only access, checking temperatures if you can, particularly if you have a lot of people who are interacting in a space. You don't want to have the spread. A dedicated cleaning staff and com and common spaces and entryways. These are just some of the elements that businesses. And people around the world who've experienced this have employed to slow the spread uh, or to stop it from reemerging uh, as a threat as they, as they begin to resume normal life. And, and if it can be done safely with hygiene and social distancing, then those are the things that come back first. If it can't, those are the things that will follow later on. And vulnerable populations. Vulnerable populations, they're going to have to continue to take care of themselves and take these precautions. These are all the things that are emerging on these lists uh, of how we reemerge. And this is what, these are the kinds of things that the governor will have to take into consideration along with the health data as we look to, as we begin to think about what restart looks like. And um, I guess I want to close with something that I read yesterday from one of uh, President Trump's economic advisors, Larry Kudlow. Uh, and, and what he said is that it's the health people that are going to drive the medical-related decisions. But I still believe, hopefully, and maybe prayerfully, that in the next four to eight weeks, we will be able to reopen the economy and that the power of the virus will be substantially reduced and we will be able to flatten the curve. And so I guess as we enter Passover uh, and uh, Easter, the Easter Holy Week, um, amen to that. Let's hope that we are able to restart this as soon as possible, but you now have a, hopefully a better understanding of the factors that go in and why Ohio is well positioned, but why Ohio still has work to do. So thank you, Governor. Thank you, Governor. Dr. Acton. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let's get started with our slides. So today we have 5,000. 148 cases as of this morning. 
that number continues to rise. We now um, are seeing cases in 83 of our 88 counties. And unfortunately, you know, the death numbers are climbing in Ohio. We are at 193, um, approaching the 200 mark. And, and as the governor and lieutenant governor said, you know, Mr. Dawson and every single one of those numbers um, is a story unto themselves. And so, you know, we talk a lot about numbers here and I always feel strange saying them because they're people and they're people with stories. And um, we're gonna tell more of those stories in the days to come and our thoughts are, are, are with you on that. Um, next, next slide, Eva. So uh, we're still seeing a median age um, of illness at 54, our age range still uh, less than a year age to 101. We have now tested 53,000 folks. Hospitalizations, um, to date almost 1,500 hospitalizations and ICU admissions at about 472 right now. And these weeks that you have created have given our hospitals and our healthcare system really time to structure and be ready. We still are experiencing, again, shortages of testing, plague us, and shortages of PPE, as the governor said. So the, the actions you're taking and keeping the pressure off our healthcare system are vital, <laughs> because otherwise um, they wouldn't be able to provide that care for emergencies like our, our heart attacks and our strokes and car accidents and births. So the work you're doing uh, in staying at home has been saving lives, and let me show you a little more about that. So the good news, and I know there's a lot, a lot being said about modeling. Again, the weather prediction models that will continue to change and ebb and flow. Um, all the decisions we made, you know, were based on the reality of a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic, and sort of what we are seeing, both clinically and what we knew works to slow down a disease for which there is no cure yet, for which everyone in the entire world was susceptible. So these models, I wanna tell you more about them, but the most important punchline is this. Every single modeler, everyone who talks about it is saying that we must keep doing what we're doing. We must, you're succeeding. You're succeeding, but the second you ease back, we'll see ourselves in, 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 in an outbreak that, that will really overwhelm our healthcare system. I think um, even the most conservative numbers of making sure we're prepared for worst case scenarios to the folks who have said, you know, we're doing so well, you know, we might not run out of ventilators, which is our whole goal all along is to not run out of that precious equipment, not be forced into difficult decisions. They are saying, Dr. Murray at the Institute for Health Metrics is trying to say to you, don't stop doing what you're doing. That's what, what these models are showing. And, and, and I wanna talk about one piece of this because it's going to be important. We were the first in, one of the first in in Ohio with these aggressive, bold moves. We wanna be one of the first states out. But we're gonna need to follow the modeling to get there. We're gonna need to follow our testing results once we have them. And it's gonna be based on this, this, this sort of premise of modeling. So we've tried to break it down for you here. It's all based on susceptible people, it's called SIR modeling, susceptible, infected, and who's recovered. And this is really back to um, how infectious is this disease, how quickly does it double? We wanna see that doubling time get much, much, much longer. We've been seeing doubling times in the United States of three days to six days. We wanna get that out to 12 days and farther uh, before we can even begin to slow down that gas. But it's all based on how this spreads. Next slide. So this is us in Ohio. This is us before, and we know now that this disease was seeding and, and spreading even before you ever met me. But you know, this is the population of Ohio waiting for a new novel coronavirus to enter. And eventually we started being seeded. And this was early on, um, even before we started making some of the moves, even before the Arnold Classic 
Um, we had travelers going back and forth. We took very aggressive measures to quarantine the people we know of, but we now know, and it's been publicized, that many, many people came back um, from places that were endemic with the virus and brought it back all over this country, and it was seeding in our country. And so those first cases landed, and then they were often, um, some were known, but many weren't, um, starting to spread the disease. And the, so one um, infected person does that Kevin Bacon degrees of infecting 2.5 to 3 people um, in their sphere of influence, and then those go, and that's where we get that logarithmic spread of the disease. That's what we didn't want. We didn't want to be Wuhan where you know, they just went straight up that curve. We wanted to slow down that spread. Keep going. So that goes more and more. So the people who are infected keep spreading. But somewhere in here, we start to get the blue dots. And those are so important. And that is going to be important for our recovery. These are the people who are now recovered. So we have our susceptible people, the orange, the people who are infected, red, spreading. But then eventually, we get those people who are recovered. And they um, are the people we're going to be detecting through our antibodies. They are going to be part of our recovery plan. They're also part of the people who can donate some of their plasma so that we can use antibodies as a form of treatment. So the blues growing is, is how, how we are going to eventually um, track this. Keep going. So before, in our earlier modeling, we knew all along that if you did nothing, we would have predicted 62,000 cases per day at the peak. And of course, we would have peaked long ago. Um, in Ohio, if we were predicting up to um, initial peak projection um, on one modeling was 98,000 cases per day. Uh, we, we had another model that six, said six to 8,000. Our latest projection is 1,600 cases per day. Still a lot of cases per day, still a load on our hospitals, but this is the effect you have done. And watch this. In Ohio, we took our, our prediction, and you have basically done this. Evo's doing our little. Governor, I don't know if you can see it, but you have squashed this and you have stretched it. Honestly, this is you. This is what you have done. This is how you have saved lives. But please know that that you know, our data, the, the reason the modeling takes a while is it took about two weeks to see the effects of the strict social distancing. And if we stopped today, if we all ran outside in two more weeks, we would have gone way back up again. So, so that's, that's the thing here. We've got to hold steady, hold the course. Next slide. So this is another way to look at it. And this is a little more of the story of what Ohio did. Um, we did early mitigation. Some people came in a little bit later. Um, and you see then that, that they're, they're worse off on the numbers at their peak. Later and later in mitigation, this would have been no mitigation. And we'll have this on our website because I'm sure it's very hard to see on your screen. But um, you know, we're very blessed to be in this category of the early mitigation. And we got to stay there. Thank you, Evo. Next slide. So a couple things I want to say to you. Um, first of all, if there ever has been a time um, that we have to realize how interdependent we all are on each other, the one health concept, the worldwide concept, this is it. Uh, there is no way out of this without what we are going to do together. And what we do in our state and what we do across this country is really going to affect each other. Um, we will be talking more and more um, just like Dr. Boutros said um, on a hospital call I was on earlier today with all the hospital CEOs, what this has done, what you have bought for our hospitals, is a way to start shifting. Not, we don't have to build out quite, quite as big, hopefully, if our behavior stays the same, in some of our big uh, centers, the way you've seen tents or doing in our uh, convention centers. We're still poised because this disease is stealth, and we don't know where it will take us next. So we have that ability to build out large facilities now. But the other thing we've been building is the ability to be mobile and agile and flexible in our response. So we now know that there are going to be hot spots like our prisons, like our nursing homes. 
And what we are doing is taking not only this, how we build out very static structures, we, in a partnership with the state and local, are being able to move things quickly. So if we see a prison that is running out of PPE, we can get that there. If we see a small hospital that needs more ventilators, we're actually going mobile. And our best experts are coming alongside each incident, each flare up, and just crushing it. And that is a big part of how we are gonna get out of this early. I also wanna say a couple other things. Um, first of all, um, in addition to being a blended family, we are also a religiously blended family. Um, Hag Sameach to all my friends. Um, I am Jewish, even my background was a mixed background growing up and um, my children were raised in the Jewish faith. My husband's children are Episcopal and they were raised in that and we are both celebrating all those holidays together and of course we're celebrating those in new ways. Um, it is vital and I, I, I pray and ask of our religious leaders in this state. One of the worst things we can do is congregate in any way that puts our population at risk. We are doing a virtual Seder tonight um, in my family. Um, my friends dropped off, I couldn't cook. They've dropped off the foods that I love and I love to cook, that's another thing I haven't shared. Um, my matzo ball soup is the best, just saying. Um, but. You know, my, my friends cooked for me, they dropped it off on my doorstep, and we're gonna be together um, talking about the story of the plagues, uh, of which have a very poignant meaning as we go through what we're going through. Um, these diseases have been around forever. And, um, but also as we celebrate Easter, and please, 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 please do this in a way that keeps us all safe this year. And I feel that we will all be closer than ever. Um, and lastly, um, I wanna say that I am wearing blue as somebody who experienced child abuse. Um, I've always been so grateful, so grateful to our governor from the very beginning of his career that has fought against um, help, helping kids who don't have a voice and who often go hidden. Please keep using those hotlines if you see something, whether it's domestic violence or child abuse. Um, this is Public Health Week. Um, it's only been for me a little bit over a year since I came to this position. One of the first things we did, so this is to my staff and my team and all the local public health people on the front line. Um, this is something I did with my students in class. Public health is that secret thing you never see until you need it. Um, unfortunately, what I fear could happen in this outbreak is that once again, we've had a huge and we're in the middle of it, public health victory in shutting this disease down and slowing its spread. The fear I have is that whenever we have these silent victories, people say, well, it was never there to begin with. There was no threat because, because we've won this public health battle. Please, 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 this battle is ongoing. And this is to all my friends out there on the front lines, risking their lives every day, doing these contact investigations your public health, and, and we support you forever. Um, and with that, um, I, I, I give it back to our governor. Thank you. Dr. Acton, thank you very much. We'll open it up for questions. Hello, good afternoon. This is Tara Morgan with Hi, sorry about that. Uh, how, could, how soon could we see more testing in Ohio to see where the virus is to ease restrictions with the president indicating in a tweet today about wanting the country to open up sooner than later and do you have a benchmark for cases to do that? Dr. Acton, you wanna take that? Yeah. Oh, we have been on the phone um, with the people who produce the tests themselves, the companies that are doing some of the greatest, most innovative um, work our country has ever seen. We uh, do not have enough testing. And they are working tirelessly. Um, they're allotting the tests that they do have um, as equitably as they can across the states. There are many, many issues in the supply chain 
having to do with the reagents that are used both in extracting the RNA and then running actual tests to, on, on it. So the, the chemicals that are needed for this, in addition to all the other things like the testing swabs we've talked about, which are again starting to show a shortage, um, they're a complex brew of chemicals um, that are large, have very intricate supply chains that are worldwide. Um, some of them are botanical type, um, bio, I'm sorry, not botanical, biological in nature, and some of them are chemical in nature. They are not things that um, I can mix up in a lab or knock off, sort of like a knockoff brand. Um, and so it's very, very complicated as to why we don't have testing. And if I was the media, I would keep asking, how can we help these companies get the things we need? This is gonna be a long haul to get all the stuff we need in testing. I know the people on the front lines are doing everything they can. A different kind of testing, that is the PCR testing um, that will allow us to know that you have the disease and it's something that's in shortage and, and I, I, I wait daily to hear how we could expand that. Um, the other kind of testing is a blood serologic testing that is a finger prick. Um, FDA just approved the first, we hope there will be many at this. And that is something, once again, that takes a while to get into production and ramp up. We are in line on every one of these cues uh, to get whatever we can. Hi, Dr. Acton. This is Molly Martinez with Spectrum News. My question is both for you and for the governor. Mahoning County is up to 28 deaths right now, and they're being associated with long-term care facilities. My question is, what, if any, support is the state offering officials in Mahoning, and what does this trend tell us about social determinants of health in that area? Well, we'll start with nursing homes um, alongside prisons and other congregate settings. They're gonna be our highest risk. So uh, Director Maureen Corcoran and a whole team um, have been working side by side with the industry nonstop since this began. We have an extensive set of guidelines and I would say if there's any way there's a nursing home uh, that is not tied into these guidelines, um, go on our website, talk to the Nursing Home Association. Um, that work is out there on how to best handle an outbreak. So what we've been able to do thus far, um, when we're approached by a local health department or a nursing home, we have a strike team. We actually take our epidemiologists, our doctors alongside that team and walk them through the best practices. But I can tell you, they are suffering out there from a shortage of PPE. Tell us, tell your local health department, throw a red flag, tell, tell the nursing home association. We need to know we do have, again, scarce resources, but we are coming alongside the nursing homes that reach out to us and helping you navigate this outbreak. Um, and, and then we're also working with you on how to best, what patients should stay in place, how to pr best protect your staff, what patients need to go to a hospital. And we also then, when someone is discharged from the hospital, need to be using consistent guidelines across the state, which exist, to help get those folks back. So um, this is ongoing work. The state has been involved in it. Um, the communication of that sometimes does not reach everywhere, and so I have a whole team whose only job it is is to keep pushing this guidance out. But if you are a nursing home sitting there alone and you need help, reach out to your local health department. They will reach out to us and we will be there with you. Social determinants, so this is all of the conditions that surround us from our housing, from our pre-existing health that we know is disparate and we know um, that those issues are being further exacerbated at a time like this. I, I wanna say this, I will be um, tomorrow talking more about the issue of social determin determinants on health. This is a huge strain on our social services. Every one of the nonprofits are dealing with the same issue, staff out, staff sick. You know, everyone's budget is being cut right now. Whether you're my agency, my budget is being cut drastically to get through this period to every nonprofit. This is something I think we need a larger discussion about by our leaders. Um, this will be something that needs to be discussed nationally because the lifeblood that helps us surround um, people who fall between the cracks is, an, is a complex one. 
It is the state, but the state is one player alongside nonprofits. Our philanthropies have come to the table to try to help, but they're all struggling. Food banks are struggling. We're all struggling. So that infrastructure, that safety net, is really being tested in ways it never has before. So in a place like Youngstown, where I grew up, people like me growing up the way I grew up, workers on the front line who can't afford to stay home right now, who are in essential businesses, are disproportionately represented. And this is a dialogue. It's so much bigger than I can do now, but it's one our, our nation needs to have. Thank you, and thank, thank you, you for your work. Thank you. Hi, this is Jesse Balmer with the Cincinnati Inquirer. Kind of following up on the nursing home question, do we know how many of Ohio's COVID patients are from nursing homes, either residents or, or yeah. staff? So our numbers that we have that we're presenting right now are based on, and it's, it's, I won't take you back through the slides, but on our website, has it broken down by people from, that are hospitalized right now from long-term care facilities? Now, at the local level, health departments are investigating each and every one of those nursing home outbreaks. So, you know, there is data that lives um, within sort of the people who have not hit hospitals that we're collecting in ODRS. Um, on cases, and that, that our case data is showing when we know that it is associated with the long term. And similarly, but once again, so many people, there aren't enough tests to go around. So once they test a few people in a nursing home and they know it's there, we are clinically assuming that the other cases that have the same symptoms are it. So that's being tracked. And actually, starting um, new uh, tomorrow, we have a case definition that has changed nationally where we aren't going to just say someone is a case because they were tested as positive. We have a new uh, definition of possible or probable case that is gonna be for all the rest of us who are mildly ill or who were diagnosed as an outpatient um, just based on symptoms. We think we have a good enough um, understanding of what a clinical case looks like. So that, that understanding of all the rest who have not been tested is gonna grow each and every day. But every nursing home, um, shouldn't be out on an island alone. They should be connected uh, with their local health department, with their regional health plan, and ultimately with my team of the most expert epidemiologists um, walking through what they need to do in each case. That's how the system should be working. And local health departments should be able to share what nursing homes might have outbreaks or issues? Right, they can tell you where some of the hot spots are. The nursing homes themselves, I think, are, are being pretty open about that. Um, that data. Adrian Robbins, NBC4, and my question's for Dr. Acton. Um, I know the report on ventilators is still not due for a couple more hours, but from what you're seeing, are you comfortable with the amount of ventilators that we have, especially with these new models showing just a fraction of the cases? And along that same line, is the concern more about PPE at this point instead of ventilators? Uh, that's a, that is a great question. So PPE was always one of the most driving factors of all of this, the lack of testing, the lack of PPE, which you know, I would love to say there is a quick fix solution right around the corner. That's why the governor is saying it's so important that people are recycling those masks, following conservation principles. Um, we need to make sure we're getting what little bit we have to the right places. Um, but ventilators, you know, this is a good story for ventilators as long as we hold steady. Uh, right now, we know our hospitals have that capacity. We have not exceeded that. Um, we are equally pursuing extra ventilators. Um, we won't need to buy as many um, if we stay steady, and that is important. Um, and we also have this stash of unused ventilators that we can move around. But, you know, these hot spots are everything. If it's a nursing home, in a community, or if it's a prison, like we saw it with Elkton um, in Salem Hospital, they quickly, look, you know, at small local hospitals, they quickly exceed that capacity. What we can now do, based on the time we have bought, is we can be more surgical about where we send it. We won't have every hospital going off the deep end at the same time, and we are actually now able to move those resources very surgically to where they need, which lets, lets us use, conserve them and use them better. And again, all of that is the blessing we've had in Ohio um, to be able to manage these cases. And I, I wanna say to the viewers, deaths are going to increase and cases are going to increase 
even when we tell you that we have you know, ventilators okay and, we're, and you've bought us time, the death data, the hospitalization lags, it lags. And, and even though we see from the modeling that we're making great headway, the news is gonna sound grim for quite some time to come um, because we know that deaths follow by about four to six weeks someone being initially maybe infected. So um, all of this is, we're going in the right direction, but we are not out of the woods by any stretch. Thank you. Jim Province with the Toledo Blade. Um, like I have a question for Governor DeWine. Um, when the parole board starts to meet this weekend uh, for, on Friday uh, to start considering the 26 cases that you've identified for potential releases, will the board be doing anything different than it normally would do? Would its considerations be any different than they have been in the past? And will the coronavirus be the driving factor when they make decisions? Well, the governor appoints the parole board, but the parole board does make its own decisions. Uh, so what the parole board takes into consideration is up, really is up to the parole board. Uh, I don't think there's going to be anything that's really different uh, except, uh, you know, they're going to meet virtually. They cannot meet in person. Uh, so that will be different. Uh, we've asked them to meet quickly, so that will be different. Uh, they're going to be dealing with a lot of cases. Uh, I don't know that that's different. They, they handle a, a pretty large volume, but that may be, even, may be higher than it would normally be. Uh, and we're going to ask them, uh, you know, depending on when each one of these comes to them, uh, you know, we may ask them to be in session on, 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 on Saturday and come back on Monday. Um, so that may be different as well. So it's, it, you know, it's, it's a different time. And so those things are different, but ultimately the parole board will come back to us, come back to me as governor with a recommendation, uh, and they may also have conditions uh, if they recommend that someone uh, should be let out. There may be, we would expect to have, certainly on some of them, conditions uh, that, will, that will be set. Thank you. Kevin Landers, WBNS TV. My question is for Dr. Acton. Hi, how are you? Happy Passover. Um, you just got done telling us that we need to keep doing what we're doing to keep to squash that curve. And at the same time today, the CDC is considering loosening guidelines for some exposed to the virus. And under those proposed guidance, people who are exposed to someone infected would be allowed back on the job if they are asymptomatic. I'm wondering if you're okay with that. So there, there are two sets of guidance. I mean, one of the things is we really have to figure out right now who truly is recovered and has built immunity. There's no doubt about um, our ability to detect that and document that, especially because so many never knew for sure if they had it. And there are asymptomatic people who have had it who actually are immune right now that don't know they are. So, so much of using that guidance, there's, they're just like I am developing the guidance on that, but our ability to do it is gonna be so tied to us knowing for sure who that is. And then, you know, we have teams of people working on how are we going to responsibly allow those folks back in the workforce. We have already talked a lot about that. I'll take healthcare workers, for example. We are having many, many, our highest numbers that are out um, in our numbers are healthcare workers. But if it's a doctor like me who's now been sidelined, had the illness and recovered, I'm exactly who you want back in your workforce right away because, you know, I'm, I'm a little more Teflon. Um, and and if, if for viewers at home, once you have this immunity, we're still learning a lot about how long that will last. Um, certainly, um, th those studies are still coming. It could be quite a while, but those folks will be very valuable in the re-entry um, back to our work and, and being able to know who you are, especially when we don't really know for most of the population who has been ill and who has recovered is gonna be crucial to using those guidelines and actually changing our policies. Um, the Lieutenant Governor said, and I think this is very important, we, we will be doing a slow walk out of these policies. 
and a slow ba walk back into the business as an expanding business. Um, those workers will be a key piece of this. Um, and how we can know that they're that so they can tell their employer that is a piece of the puzzle we're unraveling right now. But we'll, we won't be running back to mass gatherings any day soon. We won't be running back to potentially, you know, school is a big policy issue that will have to really be looked at closely. But what I do think you'll see early on in the recovery phase, which we're not there yet, we have a couple weeks to get through yet before even any of this could be implemented, um, it will start slowly probably in, in the business sector. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Ben Schwartz with WCPO in Cincinnati. Um, my question is for Governor DeWine. Governor, um, I wanna ask you about churches. We've been getting a lot of questions sent in from viewers regarding churches. And today we got a few different ones from different viewers asking why um, people like the man in Over the Rhine over the weekend are being arrested for flagrantly violating the stay-at-home order while churches have more people in an enclosed area and nobody's getting in trouble. Um, I understand that it's about freedom of religion, but is there a difference safety-wise? And are churches like the Solid Rock Church in um, Cincinnati flagrantly disregarding people's safety as much as people congregating outside? Well, good question. Um, I was going to address this anyway, so thank you for the, for the question. Uh, this is a very holy week uh, in the Jewish tradition as well as the Christian tradition. Um, the vast majority uh, of our religious institutions are closed. Uh, they're trying to reach their congregations in other ways uh, that is consistent with good health and consistent with the respect for life uh, and of their members of their congregation. Um, I, Lieutenant Governor, I just got off a call uh, 1130 with some of our mayors and we heard some stories about uh, some churches that were not doing that, uh, pastors that were not doing that. Uh, and so let me again make an appeal. Uh, and let me just be very direct and blunt. Um, we're not going to interfere with your First Amendment rights uh, to practice your religion. But I don't know any religion that teaches that you should do things that endanger, seriously endanger, other people. I don't know any religion that says that it's just okay not to worry about your neighbor. It's okay not to worry about other people. When we're dealing with this virus, uh, we know it's all about not spreading it. And when people come together in a large group, um, at this stage, at this stage of how far we are along in Ohio, uh, we can almost guarantee you uh, that in a church, even not a very large church, there will be people who would test positive, uh, who already have it, they may not know it, uh, and you're really playing with the lives of your congregation. Uh, I am not a doctor, but I think if you consult your own doctor or consult anyone uh, else who, in the science field, they will tell you the same thing. So the difference is, to answer your question, the difference is we are not going to violate people's First Amendment rights. Uh, we've kind of drawn a line. Uh, we're not going to put uh, someone uh, who will uh, stand in the door and stop people from going in a church. Uh, but um, we just ask everyone to love your neighbor. Thank you, Governor. Hi, uh, Laura Bischoff, Dayton Daily News. My question is for uh, Governor DeWine. Um, the collective bargaining contract with the state's largest union um, representing state workers has a provision in it that allows for hazard pay premium of $8 an hour. Uh, should that 
premium be paid during this emergency to um, essential workers who are in public facing jobs such as, or in, in prison jobs? Why or why not? Well, we've not really looked at that. Um, we have, uh, you know, tragically, a lot of people who are in dangerous jobs today, uh, both in the public sector uh, in, in, and in the private sector. Uh, these, are, these are certainly unusual times. Uh, the person who's working, stocking the shelves in a grocery store it can be exposed to, to a lot of different people. Um, you know, one of the things that I've asked the director of DRC to do uh, again, is to take a look uh, at, you know, what are some of the other things that we can do in regard to our most vulnerable uh, employees. Uh, as you know, uh, the death that we reported uh, today, um, you know, he had some underlying health issues. And so one of the things we're looking at is how we deal, how we deal with that. Um, we have people with underlying health uh, challenges who are doing a lot of different jobs in society today. So figuring out how to balance this and how to come up uh, with something that protects people is, is something that's very much on my mind, but I don't have a direct answer for you. Thank you. This is Danny Eldridge with Hanna News Service. Uh, my question's for Governor DeWine. Um, so can you just talk about your, the timeline for, so you've asked all your agencies to come up with 20% budget cut scenarios and those were due uh, yesterday. Can you talk about your timeline for uh, when this will occur and what your plan, like ODGFS was saying they're hiring a lot more people. Are they gonna be cutting too? Like, Well, look, in case, we've, we said very early on uh, that it, anybody who is directly impacted by the coronavirus and has to react to that um, is going to have to do what they have to do. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody wanted us to be in a position where you've got people uh, who are unemployed, uh, who are trying to get the benefits and the system crashes and we don't have enough people to answer the phone. So we obviously have to surge people in there. The same things, you know, their positions in regard to uh, what's going on with public health and the expenditure of money uh, in regard to the coronavirus. As far as the timetable, uh, we asked uh, each department to get these in. I think it was either last night or this morning. Uh, they have done that. Our team is starting to review that. I have not looked at them yet, but I certainly will be very, very shortly uh, and starting to weigh what our options are. Uh, un unfortunately, as you can well imagine, uh, the options are not good. Um, when, you know, we have about four departments that uh, constitute a huge portion of, of the budget. Uh, so, you know, you're gonna, we're gonna have to look at those departments, we're gonna have to look at every department and see what, what we can do. We asked the departments, all the members of the cabinet, to aim for 20% knowing that some departments simply cannot do that uh, because of the legal, some of the legal obligations that, that they have. But we ask that, as for starters, to people to, to, to take a look at that. So as we work through this, uh, we're gonna bring the public uh, into this. Uh, we're gonna share with the public uh, what our analysis is. But uh, with 15 months to go in, in the year, uh, it's important we know uh, we have a problem, and we know we have a problem um, that's all around us, and that is the number of people who are not working. Uh, whenever that happens, benefits go up, costs go up, uh, social service costs go up. At the same time, um, revenues go down dramatically. So that's our challenge. And, and, we have to, and we, of course, to state the obvious, we have to balance the budget. We, we do not have the option of printing more money. So we have to balance the budget. Thank you, Governor. Hi there, it's uh, Andrew Welsh Huggins with the Associated Press, and this is a question for Dr. Acton. Hi, doctor. Um, a quick follow-up on the nursing homes. Um, we've talked to some operators who feel like they should have a priority in testing along with the other healthcare facilities. Did, did the new testing model or standard that you mentioned previously today, would that cover it 
um, there are concerns or is there any wiggle room for expanding the current testing um, standard to nursing homes? Yeah, so, so nursing homes, um, prisons, we have a three-tier system. I believe it's on our, our website, but I'll make sure if it's not there, it is. But um, they are in the hierarchy of testing and it really, how much testing occurs, it, it, we don't have enough testing to sort of blanket test everyone in a nursing home. And as you know, early on in illness, it can be falsely negative when it's positive. But often there's some testing of the initial cases in a nursing home, and then it's assumed by the clinical picture. So based on the testing that's available, um, one of the things we've been working on, again, and the bane of my existence is the fact that we can't do this. We have everything set up to do it. We have the ability to do mobile units and go to prisons and go to nursing homes. We have staff to do it once we have more testing. Um, because that's the way we want to do it. If we had limited resources, we would just go after places that are the highest risk and make it as easy and convenient as possible. And, and so we are doing testing in nursing homes, but sometimes based on you know, the history that is being taken there, they might do one or two or three cases, know they have it, and say, we know we have it. So it's, it's, it's a very individual nursing home situation. But I agree, I mean, I feel that same way. We're working hard to test. You know, we would like to test first responders. Um, so it really is um, really judicious use of the tests that exist to kind of diagnose what's happening in a situation and then use your clinical and honestly good diagnostic skills to uh, go from there. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Governor. Andy Chow with Ohio Public Radio and Television, State House News Bureau. Um, last night, President Donald Trump criticized man should fight very hard to fight statewide mail-in voting. What are your thoughts on Ohio's mail-in voting system? Are you at all worried that the president's comment might discourage people in Ohio to vote? Well, I didn't hear the president's comments. Um, but we have a process that's going on uh, in Ohio. People have the opportunity to, to vote. Uh, we encourage people to go vote, uh, to, you know, to, uh, the Secretary of State's given them uh, several different options to be able to do that. Uh, I know in our local paper uh, last night, in the Xenia paper, uh, there, was a, there was a thing that you could just tear out, fill out, send it in. I know a number of papers are actually doing that. Uh, people can go online, they can get an application uh, for, for a ballot. Uh, they can actually even write a letter uh, to the local uh, board of election. They can call the local board of election. I think if they write the letter, they have to have their last four digits of, of their social security uh, card there. So we've made it pretty easy uh, in, in Ohio. Um, as you know, this was not my choice or, or the secretary of state's. Uh, we had a different plan, uh, but uh, the legislature came up with this plan. We accept that. Uh, we think it's a plan that will allow people to, to vote, and we encourage everyone uh, to continue to, you know, to exercise that, that right to vote. And you believe Ohio's process is safe, not corrupt? Oh, well, I think our process is safe. Uh, you know, look, I mean, w w we stopped the election. Uh, in-person voting because we did not think it was safe. Uh, we didn't think it was safe for the 35,000 poll workers. We didn't think it was safe for people to having to go vote uh, in person uh, right in the midst of, of a virus like this. Uh, so we felt that all of this we was, you know, we postponed the election or we extended the election basically uh, because we didn't think it was safe. But yes, it's safe for people to vote uh, in, in Ohio and uh, we're asking them to do that. Thank you. Hello, this is Laura Hancock from cleveland.com and I've been told this is the last question. Um, I have a question about um, vape shops and just kind of COVID and vaping. Um, there, 
throughout the state that there, there's like kind of an inconsistent enforcement. Some state health department or some local health departments are shutting down these stores. Some of the stores are still open and they're all kind of doing a different thing. Some people are only doing curbside delivery. Some people are open to the public. So I wanted to know about that. And then also there's um, some early research showing that people who smoke and vape might be getting sicker when they get COVID. And I was wondering if you could address that as well. I'll take the I'll, I'll take the first part. I was not I did not understand what kind of businesses did you say? Oh, I'm sorry, vaping shops. Um, yeah, I've, this has not been brought to my attention that there is a uh, any inconsistency uh, in in regard to that. So I will I will certainly certainly check check into that, see how it's being enforced uh, around the state. But I was, not, I was not aware of that. You know, we're on the phone to local uh, officials a lot. And one of the questions I always ask them is, is there a problem, inconsistency in enforcement, how's the enforcement going, uh, et cetera. So I will, I'll inquire. Dr. Acton, you want to take? Oh, I, I will just add, Governor, the, the that, medical part of that there so. is medical research, obviously pre-existing health conditions. So anything with the lungs from asthma, um, COPD, folks with that, or I know, I hope at home you're being very, very careful. And certainly smoking and now air pollution. So there are some studies out that are showing that um, even in areas of our country where the air pollution is different, all of that, of course, takes more of a toll on your lungs. And of course, we know smoking does. And again, remember, we know this nicotine is a highly addictive substance. Um, people can't just stop what they're doing on a dime very easily. We know that. Um, but this is important to know that um, it is a risk factor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, a celebration of uh, Passover begins this evening. Um, I want to thank Howie Bigelman uh, with the Ohio Jewish uh, communities for being so really proactive in providing uh, appropriate guidance to communities across the state about how to safely uh, celebrate uh, Passover. Several years ago, Fran and our granddaughter Izzy uh, were fortunate to have shared a Passover meal with some friends of ours in the, in the Columbus area. And we remember that night, uh, one of the first questions asked around the table was, why is this night different from all other nights? Well, th this Passover uh, is certainly different. Uh, certainly different because, unfortunately, many cannot share the holiday with family, friends, guests that they traditionally have invite for the celebration. Uh, yet, in spite of the pandemic, uh, we find ourselves celebrating the Festival of Freedom. Uh, Passover teaches us that with sacrifice, with faith, trust in each other, uh, we can overcome even the most challenging obstacles. It's the lesson of the history. COVID-19 is showing us that no matter what our religion is, we are all Ohioans. We're Buckeyes, we're strong, and together, together, we can overcome anything. We look forward to seeing you all uh, tomorrow again at 2 o'clock. Thank you very much.